Hello everyone and Assalamualaikum The topic for this video is gastrointestinal motility and physiology of vomiting With regards to GI motility, we are going to look into the motility of each of these regions stomach, small intestine and large intestine Let us begin with stomach First, let us look into some of the important functions of stomach one of the functions of stomach is it mixes saliva, food, and gastric juice to form chyme. Chyme is a thick semi-fluid mass of partially digested food and digestive secretions. So stomach plays a part in digestion process to form chyme before they enter the intestine. Another function of stomach is it secretes gastric juice. Gastric juice contains hydrochloric acid enzymes such as pepsin and gastric lipase, mucus and intrinsic factor. Each of the contents of gastric juice performs their specific function in digestion process. Aside from gastric juice, stomach also secretes gastrin into the blood circulation, where gastrin's function is to increase stomach motility, contracts lower esophageal sphincter, relaxes pyloric sphincter and etc. Another function of stomach is to perform chemical digestion and absorb small quantity of water, ions, short-chain fatty acids, and some drugs. Stomach also performs mechanical digestion, which is to churn and physically break down the food. Stomach also serves as food reservoir before release into the small intestine. And subsequently, it performs gastric emptying. Stomach will secrete gastrin, whereby gastrin will relax the pyloric sphincter. So the chyme that was stored in the stomach are forces through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum. So these are the main function of stomach. Gastric motility is different during fasting and feeding. Or basically, it depends on the existence or present of food in the stomach. When there is no food, stomach will enter fasting state. During fasting state, there will be migrating motor complex or MMC in the stomach. MMC is a cyclic motor pattern or electromechanical activity that occurs in interdigestive period, which is the period between meals or fasting state. MMC is dependent upon an intact ENS. Remember in previous lecture, I have explained about ENS or enteric nervous system. It is the intrinsic control of GI smooth muscle that control GIT motility and secretions. So if ENS is working fine, there will be MMC. The function of MMC is to clear the GIT as well as to prevent bacterial overgrowth or in other words it perform housekeeping meaning it sweep undigested material or any residue through the digestive tract mmc consists of three phases phase one is period of motor inactivity in this phase there is no spike potential and no contractions Phase 2 is period of intermittent motor activity. There are spike potential and contractions, but it is irregular. Phase 3 is a period of regular and repetitive contractions. The spike potential are regular, so the contractions are also regular. This is the pattern of MMC. MMC is initiated by motilin. Motilin is a hormone secreted by the M cells of small intestine mainly in the duodenum. MMC migrate aborally from stomach to distal ileum. The propagation rate is about 5 cm per minute. If we look at one cycle of MMC that consists of the three phases, this one cycle of MMC first occur in the stomach. This particular cycle then move about 5 cm aborally meaning toward the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. It moves about 5 cm in 1 minute. 
at one particular location, for example in the stomach, the intervals of each MMC is approximately 90 minutes. The interval between the two cycles of MMC, about 90 minutes. Phase 1, which is the period of inactivity, occur longer. Followed by a few minutes of irregular contractions, phase 2, and regular contractions, phase 3, that occur about 90 minutes after the last contractions. During each MMC, there is increase of gastric secretion, bioflow, and pancreatic secretion. MMC is immediately stopped by ingestion of food. Notice here that when during meal or ingestion of food, there is no MMC. And then after meal, MMC resume which is to clear the GI tract of the residue. Now, let us take a look at stomach motility in fat state. It consists of three phases, gastric filling, propagated peristatic contractions, and gastric emptying. So gastric filling, this phase is when stomach is being filled with meal. Empty stomach can expand to more than one liter. However, increase in gastric content is not parallel with increase in gastric pressure. Supposedly, increase in volume will result in increase in pressure. But in stomach, this is not the case. Because, as we have learned in previous lecture with regards to plasticity of smooth muscle, or also called stress relaxation response, smooth muscle is able to maintain its original contraction force even after it has been stretched. So stomach smooth muscle cell can be stretched without a change in tension. Gastric distension causes receptive relaxation of the fundus and body of the stomach. This reflex is mediated by vagus nerve with vasoactive intestinal peptide and nitric oxide as the neurotransmitters. Followed by gastric filling, Propagated peristaltic contractions begin soon afterwards. Peristalsis begins in lower portion of the body of stomach and sweep towards the pylorus. The peristaltic wave is controlled by the basic electrical rhythm BR or slow waves. The peristaltic wave causes contraction of the distal stomach. Distal stomach include antrum and pylorus. This process is also called antral systole which is the contraction of the distal stomach that is caused by the peristatic wave. Antral systole or contraction lasts up to 10 seconds per contraction and this occurs about 3 to 4 times per minute. When strong peristatic waves arrive at the antrum, the pressure on the antral content increases but the antral contraction closes the pyloric sphincter. This is the onset of antral contraction. During onset, pyloric sphincter begin to close. When antral contraction is complete, pylorus is closed completely. So this forces the content back into the body of the stomach. This process contributes to mixing of the antral content. When the stomach content has been properly break down and mixed with gastric juice, gastric emptying phase will commence. The emptying of stomach content is regulated by the pyloric valve. Pyloric valve also prevents regurgitation of duodenal content back into the stomach. There are different factors that may cause the pyloric valve either to relax or constrict. Pyloric relaxation can be due to inhibitory vagal fibers, which is mediated by VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and nitric oxide as the neurotransmitters. On the other hand, pyloric constriction can be due to excitatory cholinergic vagal fibers, sympathetic fibers, and hormones such as cholestogynin, GIP, and secretin. Gastric emptying rate can be either faster or slower, depending on several factors. One of the factors is gastric volume. Increased gastric volume or gastric distension will cause gastric emptying rate to be faster. 
Another factor is particle size of gastric content. Increased fluidity of gastric content causes emptying rate to increase. Caloric content and composition of the meal that we ingested will also determine gastric emptying rate. Meal that is high in fat and amino acid causes gastric emptying rate to decrease. Meaning gastric emptying rate is slow. Longer time is needed for the stomach to empty as more time is needed for digestion process. Another factor is osmolality where high intestinal osmolality slows gastric emptying. Low intestinal pH also slows gastric emptying. Gastrin, which is a hormone in gastric juice, functions to increase gastric motility, thereby it promotes gastric emptying, meaning emptying rate is increased with the presence of gastrin. There are several hormones that slow gastric emptying, such as GIP, CCK, secretin, and glucagon-like peptide 1. Neural mechanisms such as enterogastric reflex, which is chemical or mechanical stimulation of the duodenal mucosa that inhibits gastric peristalsis and slows gastric emptying. We will look at enterogastric reflex after this. So these are some of the important factors that may influence gastric emptying rate. Now let us look closely at enterogastric reflex. We know that it is a reflex that may slow gastric emptying rate. It is inhibition of stomach motility and secretion by signals coming from the colon and small intestine. So when duodenum is overloaded with chyme, sensory stretch receptor will be stimulated. Sensory nerve impulse will be sent to the central nervous system via vagus nerve. An impulse from the CNS will then inhibit peristalsis in the stomach. So stomach emptying is inhibited. Stimulation of enterogastric reflex may also come from the presence of irritants in the duodenum or when duodenum is obstructed. Apart from that, it is stimulated in the duodenum by a pH of 3 to 4 and in the stomach by a pH of 1.5. Upon initiation of the reflex, the release of gastrin, which is secreted by the G cells in the antrum of the stomach, is shut off. We know that gastrin function is to increase stomach motility. So when the release of gastrin is inhibited, this will inhibit gastric motility and HCL secretion. We have looked at stomach motility. Now, let us look at the motility of small intestine. Small intestine performs three major functions in digestion process. It performs mechanical digestion and propulsion. This occurs via peristalsis and it propels chyme from duodenum towards the ileum. Small intestine also performs chemical digestion, meaning small intestine secrete various enzymes that have catalytic fun function. Next, it absorbs the digested substances. Basically, it takes about 3 to 5 hours for chyme to move along the small intestine. Along the line, the chyme are mixed with mucosal cell secretion as well as with pancreatic and bile secretions. In the proximal jejunum, there are an average of 12 BR cycles per minute. And along the small intestine, BER declines, and when reaching the distal ileum, there are about 8 BER cycles per minute. During fasting state, the MMC passes along the intestine at regular intervals. Each MMC lasts 90 minutes and will restart approximately every 90 minutes. There are three types of small intestinal motility. One is peristalsis. Peristalsis propels the chyme towards the large intestine. It involves contractions and relaxation of small intestinal wall that push the chyme aborally. The second type of motility is segmentation contractions. Segmentation contractions, instead of pushing the chyme forward, 
it moves the kind to and fro to and fro notice that here the contraction occur at this segment then the contraction occur at different segment where the arrow indicated so the kind move to and fro the function is to increase chyme exposure to mucosa surface and to mix chyme with the digestive juice. These contractions occur because of increase in calcium influx at this specific wall segment. And then calcium was spread to another segment and increased calcium concentration in that segment which then caused contraction. Another type of small intestinal motility is tonic contraction. Tonic contractions are prolonged contractions. It isolates one segment of the intestine from another. Tonic contraction usually occur at sphincters. So these are the three types of small intestinal motility. Parasitic function to propel the chyme forward, whereas segmentation and tonic contractions, they slow transit time in the small intestine so the chyme stays longer which will allow the chyme to be adequately mixed with digestive juices as well as to increase absorption. Now let us look at how this motility are regulated. One of the way the motility is regulated is via neural control. For neural control we have covered this in previous lecture under neural control of GIT smooth muscle. It consists of two reflexes one of the reflex is intrinsic or enteric nervous system. This reflex is also called short reflexes because it is controlled by myenteric and submucosal plexus that lies in the small intestinal wall. Another reflex is extrinsic or autonomic nervous system, it consists of sympathetic and parasympathetic. It is also called long reflexes because it originates outside of the digestive system. Another factor that regulates small intestinal motility is hormonal. This hormonal control is by GI peptides that can either excite or inhibit motility. Besides that, they can also alter parasitic activity, alter the release of bile by altering contractions of the gallbladder. GI peptide also regulate gastric emptying to maximize digestion and absorption. Some of stimulatory peptides include CCK, insulin, motilin, and serotonin. Stimulatory meaning they increase GI motility. The major inhibitory peptides include secretin and glucagon. CCK is a hormone secreted by endocrine cells of the small intestine and by neurons in the brain and gut. It performs three main functions. It stimulates gallbladder contraction to release bile, it inhibits gastric emptying, and it promotes motility of the intestine. Motilin is also secreted by endocrine cells in the small intestine. Motilin function is to stimulate MMC, so it stimulates intestinal motility. Secretin, it is an in inhibitory peptide. It is also secreted by endocrine cells in the small intestine. It actually performs various functions in digestion process. With regards to motility, it inhibits gastric emptying. Other functions of secretin include inhibit gastric acid secretion, stimulate bicarbonate production by the pancreas, and also stimulate bile production by the liver. Glucagon like peptide wine is also secreted by endocrine cells in the small intestine. It functions to slow gastric emptying. There are also other factors that inf influence small intestinal motility such as glucocorticoids and corticolamines that are secreted during stress. There are also other factors of the immune system such as histamine, prostaglandins, leukotrienes and cytokines. So that was motility of the small intestine. Next, let's look at the motility of the large intestine. First, let us look at the function of the large intestine. It absorbs water and electrolytes. Water and electrolytes that are not absorbed by the small intestine will be absorbed here. 
Along the large intestine, from cecum to ascending, transverse, descending and sigmoid colon, more water and electrolytes are reabsorbed. So the chyme will become drier and become fecal matter or feces. So motility in the large intestine is slow to allow absorption of water and electrolytes. Here mixing is more difficult because the fecal matter has become denser. Large intestine absorb about 90% of the water from the chyme. Each day, the colon converts about 1 liter to 2 liter of isotonic chyme to about 200 to 250 milliliter of semi-solid feces. Another function of the large intestine is secretion. It secretes mucin, which function to lubricate the fecal matter. To ease the motility of the fecal matter along the large intestine, as well as to ease defecation. Another function of the large intestine is to synthesize bacterial flora and important vitamin and minerals such as folic acid, vitamin B12 and vitamin K. And last but not least, large intestine function as a reservoir. Chyme that cannot be digested or absorbed will form feces. So these feces are stored in sigmoid colon until expelled via defecation. There is one structure in between small and large intestine that is important to prevent backflow of fecal contents from the cecum into the ileum. So this structure is ileocecal valve. The name is ileocecal as it is located in between ileum and cecum. So this is the valve. It protrudes into the lumen of the cecum. When cecal content is increased, Pressure in the cecum will also increase and pushes backward against the valve, causing the valve to close. So, cecal contents will not reflux into the ileum. Apart from the valve, there is ileocecal sphincter, which is a thickened circular muscle at the wall of the end of the distal ileum. This sphincter is normally closed. When there is peristaltic wave, some of the ileal, ileal chyme will squirt into the cecum. The reflex that may initiate the opening of the ileocecal valve is gastroilia reflex. This reflex usually occurs following a meal, after we eat. So it is stimulated by the presence of food in the stomach as well as gastric peristalsis. Initiation of the reflex intensifies peristalsis in the ileum, causing the opening of the ileocecal valve. So, this will allow the emptying of the ileal contents into the cecum. Colonic motility is coordinated by basic electrical rhythm of the colon. The frequency of the BER increases along the colon from about 2 BER cycles per minute at the ileocecal valve to 6 BER cycles per minute at the sigmoid colon. At the small intestine, BER frequency decreases along the line but in the large intestine, BER frequency increases along its length. There are three types of colonic motility. One is mixing movement or also called haustrations. This motility is similar to segmentation contractions in the small intestine. Contraction of the haustrum or haustral contraction is activated by the presence of chyme or fecal matter. The function is to aid mixing of colonic content as well as to expose more of the contents to the mucosal surface to facilitate absorption. It also functions to move the chyme slowly to the next house straw. Another type of colonic motility is of course peristalsis. Peristalsis propels the content toward the rectum. One motility that is unique for large intestine is mass action contraction. This contraction occurs about 3 to 4 times per day. It is simultaneous contractions of the smooth muscle occurring at the same time over a large area of colon, especially in the descending and sigmoid colon. The function of this type of motility is to move material from one portion of the colon to another and into the rectum. The distension of the rectum will initiate defecation reflex. Defecation reflex is a spinal reflex. 
distension of the rectum with feces will initiate reflex contractions of its muscles and we will feel the desire to defecate. This process can be voluntarily inhibited or facilitated. Defecation can be inhibited by keeping the external anal sphincter contracted. And it can be facilitated by relaxing the external anal sphincter and contracting the abdominal muscle. So meaning, after the defecation reflex is triggered, you can either defecate or you can also delay it. The urge to defecate will first occur when rectal pressure increases to about 18 mm mercury. And if the pressure reaches 55 mm mercury and above, both the internal and external sphincter will relax. So, defecation or expulsion of rectal content will occur. At rest, anorectal angle is about 90 to 100 degrees. Anorectal angle is between the anal canal and the lower rectum. Puborectalis muscle contract, this will inhibit defecation. Before the rectal pressure reaches 55 mm mercury, voluntary defecation can be initiated by straining, which is forced inspiration against close, close glottis. Straining is also termed as wasaba maneuver. Well, wasaba maneuver is like the fancy word for straining. So during straining, the anorectal angle opens or widens to about 178 degrees, becoming almost straight. At the same time, abdominal muscle contract, pelvic floor is lowered about 1 to 3 cm and puborectalis muscle relax. This is combined with relaxation of the external anal sphincter, so defecation can happen. Now we are going to look at the nerves that are involved in defecation reflex, how impulse are transmitted. The stimulus of this reflex is feces in the rectum. So feces will stimulate stretch receptors on the rectal wall. The afferent impulse will then transmit it via pelvic nerve or sensory nerve to the sacral segment, which is the defecation center. From the sacral segment, the efferent impulse travels via pelvic nerve, specifically parasympathetic nerve, to the colon and rectum. This efferent impulse will increase peristalsis of the colon and contraction of the rectum. The impulse will also cause the internal anal sphincter to relax. So far, these whole processes are involuntary something that we cannot control. There are another set of impulses coming from the cerebral cortex. They are transmitted via pudendal nerves to the external anal sphincter. This process is voluntary, which is something that we can control. If we are not ready to defecate, we keep the external anal sphincter contracted. But when we are ready, then we relax the external anal sphincter so, defecation can then occur. There is one reflex that may influence defecation reflex. This reflex is called gastrocolic reflex. So, as the name suggests, it has something to do with gastric, or stomach, and colon. Have you ever wondered why sometimes after we eat, then we suddenly feel the urge to defecate? This is actually gastrocolic reflex. This reflex is stimulated when stomach is being filled with food. Stomach distension will initiate contractions of the rectum so that the rectum can be emptied to make room for the new food that has just entered the stomach. This reflex is a vagal reflex. The response may also be amplified by actions of gastrin and CCK on the colon. Because of this response, Defecation after meals is the rule in children, especially babies who are, who are still in diapers. They usually defecate right after they had their meal. So this is gastrocolic reflex. In adults, habit and cultural factors play a large role in determining when defecation occurs because adults know when is the right time to defecate. 
If the time is right, then we can just go to the bathroom and facilitate this, this reflex. But if not, even though we feel this, this reflex, but we can inhibit it until the time is right. This is the summary of GI motility. These are the type of movement and the organ or structure that have this type of movement. Tonic contractions are mainly on sphincters. Peristalsis, basically the whole GIT from stomach to the colon. The function is to propel the food forward. Segmentation contraction, the function is to mix the food. It occurs in the small intestine and colon. MMC occur in the stomach and small intestine during fasting. Hydration occur in the ascending, transverse and descending colon, whereas mass movement occur in transverse, descending and sigmoid colon. Now, the next topic for this lecture is physiology of vomiting. Vomiting or emesis is described as forceful expulsion of the upper GIT contents through the mouth. The upper GIT contents are mainly gastric contents and sometimes duodenal contents as well. Vomiting is useful for expelling unwanted materials in the GIT. It is a protective reflex of the stomach to protect the body from any toxic substance that we may have ingested. However, if vomiting continue for a long time, it may cause metabolic alkalosis and dehydration because vomit usually contains a lot of water. Vomiting reflex is usually preceded by premonitory signs, which are autonomic response. These signs include nausea, tachycardia, salivation, sweating, cold skin, dilation of pupil, high blood pressure, and pallor. Vomiting reflex is also usually preceded by a series of retches. So what is retches or retching? Retching is the reverse peristalsis of the stomach and esophagus without vomiting. Peristalsis is supposed to move food aborally, but during retching, there is reverse peristalsis, meaning instead of moving aborally, stomach content are being pushed orally to the mouth but yet without vomiting. During retching, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes, but the upper esophageal sphincter remains constricted. The antrum of the stomach also contracts, whereas the fundus and cardia, cardia relax. Contractions of abdominal muscles may move stomach contents into the esophagus. During retching, we inspire against partially closed glottis. The inspiratory movement of the chest wall and diaphragm are opposed by expiratory contractions of the abdominal muscles. Increasing strength of retches leads to vomiting. So basically, retches is almost the same as vomiting but without vomiting. Vomiting can be induced by intracranial stimuli or Extracranial stimuli. Intracranial stimuli include emotion, such as unpleasant sight or smell. When we suddenly smell something bad, we may feel the urge to vomit. Drugs such as morphine, digital derivatives are also intracranial stimuli for vomiting. Other stimuli are raised intracranial pressure. For example, in the case of brain tumor, bleeding or swelling in the brain and excessive stimulation of semicircular canals. For example, if you turn around multiple times or when you are in the airplane and the plane moves up and down due to turbulence or when you are on a roller coaster, for example. So those are some of the intracranial stimuli for vomiting. Extracranial stimuli, meaning these stimuli come from outside of the cranium. Intracranial stimuli come from within the cranium, but extracranial meaning it comes from outside of the cranium. Extracranial stimuli include GIT receptors, for example, when there is either gastritis, pharyngitis, small intestinal obstruction, or pyloric stenosis. Pain receptors in the genital urinary tract, touch receptor during pharyngeal stimulation. Other extracranial stimuli are endocrine factors such as increase in estrogen level during pregnancy, 
production of endogenous substances as a result of radiation, infection or disease, as well as when there is stimulation of sensory nerve of the heart and viscera. So these are some of the intracranial and extracranial stimuli for vomiting. Now let's take a look at the neural pathways of vomiting. Vomiting is controlled by the vomiting center. The vomiting center consists of scattered groups of neurons in the reticular formation of medulla oblongata. Input to the vomiting center include chemoreceptor cells in the chemoreceptor trigger zone (CTZ), vestibular system, visceral efferents and sensory efferents and CNS pathways. CTZ is situated in area posterior at the base of the fourth ventricle. It has numerous receptors for dopamine type 2, serotonin, opioid, acetylcholine, and receptors for substance P, which is a neuropeptide. So stimulation of this receptor are involved in different pathways that may lead to vomiting. The vestibular system is stimulated during motion sickness, which is an intracranial stimuli. Vestibular nuclei are rich in muscarinic and histamine type 1 receptor. So impulse from the vestibular system travels via cranial nerve 8 or vestibular uh, cochlea nerve to the brain. Vermitting center and CTZ also receive signals from visceral afferents. The stimulus can come from peripheral organs or endogenous toxins or drug. For example, if there is irritation on the stomach mucosa, either by chemotherapy, radiation, or acute infectious gastroenteritis, this will activate serotonin receptor of the visceral efferent. Impulse will then be sent to the CTZ or nucleus of the solitary tract to the vomiting center. Sensory efferent and CNS pathways mediate vomiting that arise from pain, emotional factors, psychiatric disorders, or stress. Impulses are sent to the higher brain centers and to the vomiting center. When the vomiting center has been sufficiently stimulated, impulse will be sent to the somatic and visceral receptors where the final effect is vomiting. This is the notes of what I have explained in the last figure. You can read it up. When CTZ is stimulated, there are three types of outputs, which represent the act of vomiting. These outputs include motor, parasympathetic nervous system, and sympathetic nervous system. Motor involves the vomiting act itself. We will look at this shortly. One of the parasympathetic nervous system output is Increase in salivation. Increase in salivation during vomiting is actually important because vomit contains hydrochloric, hydrochloric acids from the stomach. So saliva may protect the tooth enamel from erosion. Vomiting also initiates sympathetic nervous system response, causing sweating and increase in heart rate. When the vomiting center has been sufficiently stimulated, the vomiting act will begin starting with deep inspiration and closure of glottis. The larynx is raised to open the upper esophageal sphincter. The soft palate is elevated to close to the posterior nares. The diaphragm then contracts sharply downward and this will create negative pressure in the thorax. This negative pressure facilitates the opening of the esophagus and distal esophageal sphincter. Simultaneously, muscle of the abdominal, mus abdominal wall will contract vigorously and squeezing the stomach. This contraction causes intragastric pressure to increase. With the pylorus closed and the esophagus relatively open, the route of exit is clear, so gastric and often small intestinal contents are propelled to the esophagus, followed by ejection of vomitus. During vomiting, the stomach, esophagus, gastroesophageal sphincters, and pyloric sphincter remain relaxed. This figure summarizes our topic of physiology of vomiting. 
It started with stimulus to the vomiting center. The stimulus can come from intracranial or extracranial. Examples of stimuli include unpleasant sights of smell, irritation of digestive tract, pain, fear, chemicals, increase in intracranial pressure, or motion sickness. So vomiting center coordinate reflex through cranial nerve 5, 7, 9, 10, and 12. This is followed by pre-monetary signs such as hypersalivation, pallor, sweat, and tachycardia. The vomiting act commences with deep inspiration, closure of glottis, eleva elevation of soft palate, then diaphragm contract, gastroesophageal sphincter relax, fundus of stomach relax, followed by vigorous contraction of abdominal muscle, together with antiperistatic waves, pushing stomach contents out through the mouth. So that's all for this topic, GI motility and physiology of vomiting. If you have any question regarding this topic, please email me at kairono at usm.my. Thank you.